Right. Okay, so as I John mentioned, I'm going to talk about the uh, use of gravimetric vapors option to characterize the catalyst, in particular one which I use for CO2 hydration reaction. Before I start, I would like to thank you all for dialing in today. Uh, we appreciate very much your time, you giving us. So also, I also would like to acknowledge my collaborators, Kali Hassan and Lydia Schiller from School of Engineering at the University of Newcastle. These are the people who actually provide the sample and help this work to happen. So let's dive in. Okay. As you all know, one of the most discussed topics nowadays, except the coronavirus, is probably the rise of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is actually one of the major factors responsible for increase of global surface temperature. As you can see from this plot here, the amount of carbon dioxide in atmosphere has been steadily increasing from the 1950s, and the trajectory trajectory shows that it will carry on increasing unless we are going to stop it. Hence, multinational agreements, so the Paris agreements, have been uh, made to control carbon dioxide emissions and limit the uh, rise of uh, global temperature by two degrees. Uh, there are several sources of uh, carbon dioxide, which are listed, shown on the slides here. So we have the energy sector, as we mentioned, mm -hmm. mainly the fossil fuels, oil refineries, semen industry, iron industry. Now, there are two main, uh, there are two main uh, captures. Metals. One of is the carbon capture utilization, and the other one, the other one is carbon capture storage to reduce the CO2 in atmosphere. Today, we are going to focus mainly on our carbon capture storage and in particular on mineral carbonation, which is very important. Mineral carbonation, for instance, geological storage, in, uh, or the other storage options, let's say geological storage. So, the mineral carbonation process for carbon sequestration. So first let's define what the carbon sequestration, which refers to sequences of stores carbon dioxide in three soils, oceans, or in geological formation. So mineral carbonation involves reacting carbon dioxide with metal oxides, such as magnesium oxide, calcium oxide, to form magnesium carbonate or calcium carbonate. Here we see the actual typical reaction. The first step, there are three steps for mineral carbonation. The first step is uh, carbonation. Basically, this is a process of carbon dioxide dissolving a liquid. For example, carbon dioxide is, is added to water to, under pressure to make it easy drink. The second step is reaction of aqueous carbon dioxide with water or catalyst to form carbonic acid. This is a reversible reaction. Each carbonic acid can be transferred back to bicarbonate. This reaction can be actually controlled, accelerated by catalysts. So in this case, we can use either carbonic anhydride, hydrochloric acid, or boric acid. So they're typical catalysts. But the aim of this work today is actually to replace this catalyst using the nickel nanowires or nickel nanoparticle catalysts. The reaction rate or extent of the carbonation process is influenced mainly by the particle size, surface area, pH of steering rate, and temperature pressure. So the main goal of this work is to study actually these nickel nanowires and nickel nanoparticles in the silicon aerogel catalysts and compare their performance between each other for the carbon dioxide hydration reaction. As I mentioned, so this is a uh, materials which are employed as a catalyst for silicon aerogels. So nickel nanowires and nickel nanoparticles were initially synthesized by following solar thermal process. I'm not going to into details, it was by chain. And nickel nanowires and nickel nanoparticles on silicon aerogels were synthesized following the solar gel process. As you can see on the left-hand side, we have the TEM image of uh, nickel nanowires, which showing the wavy structure. 
And on the right hand side, we look at the details of silicon aerogels and the size particles. Now we look at the this material, this catalyst, went through the characterization uh, traditional characterization processes like SEM XRD. So we're going to go through these now. So now first we're going to look at the uh, scanning electron microscope images at different magnifications of uh, nickel nanowires catalysts or silicon aerogels. So SEM images of nickel nanowires composites composites confirms the mesopod of nature of the support. Estimation of the pore diameter from SEM images allows shows that the majority of these pores is in the range between 20 to 4 nanometer. So as you can see, this is uh, clearly shown for 400 ppm nickel nanowires and 500 ppm nickel nanowires. If you look at the 700 ppm nanowires, we can all we can see except of the mesoporos, we see also some macroporos because you can observe the pores which are larger than 50 nanometers in this case here. Now, the other characterization of fingerprint techniques, which is generally used to characterize material, is X ray diffraction. So, here we look at the X ray diffraction of silica gel, silica gel nickel nanowires. So, previously, you had this broad peak around uh, 25 theta, which can be applied to amorphous silica. And then you have 111. A, which can be assessed to nickel nanoparticles. So nickel nanowires, extra diffraction potential at the bottom, uh, is in nickel nanowires, extra diffraction of uh, insulator aerogel. So we just uh, confirm the, the correct phase of the material, of the catalyst was. The other characterization, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to look at the aqueous and gaseous characterization. So we start from this aqueous characterization. So it is liquid phase characterization. When we're looking at the pH changes during the bubbling of carbon dioxide through the ionized water at atmospheric pressure and uh, room temperature. So what you see here on X axis, we have the time in seconds, on the Y axis, we have the pH. First, what we see here is the fact that the silica aerogel, which is this line in blue, sh shows no activity for CO2 hydration, CO2 hydration reaction at all. The strongest activity for CO2 hydration reaction shows pure nickel nanowires, which is can be seen by this solid black line here. Now, when we look at the different composition of uh, nickel nanowires in silica aerogel, what we observe as the loading of the silica or nickel nanowires is increased, let's say from uh, 500, from 400, 500 to 700, the catalytic uh, activity for CO2 hydration uh, reaction is increased. So the conclusion is more silicon, uh, more nickel otherwise is dropped into the silicon energy catalyst, better catalytic, better catalytic performance we're getting in uh, aqueous characterization. Now, now we're gonna move to the main part of the talk, which is about the gaseous characterization. And gaseous characterization is basically refers to the vapor of gas phase characterization, and this is going to be described by physics option process. So if you look at the scheme or typical physics option process, where you can vapor or gas molecule reacts with a solid surface of a material. And these uh, from, uh, this can form a top layer, and some of the molecule might diffuse into the bulk of the solid. And the pressure is increased, or relative pressure of humidity is more molecule get absorbed into the molecule. And as you can see, the rest of the molecule, it does not get into the contact. It's a solid material, they just can get out of the system. So this is the typical physics option process, a thermodynamic equilibrium where heat absorption is equal to heat evaporation at each isotherm point. Now this uh, this absorption process can be described by adsorption isotherm. So the adsorption isotherm is a relationship between the amount of gas or vapor absorber against the equilibrium relative pressure. As you can see on this uh, picture down here, the relative pressure is shown on x-axis. 
the demand has dropped in short on the y-axis. Now, what is important in exercise is we have the uh, ratio P over P naught. What does it mean? This is the pressure divided by saturation pressure of pure absorptive at the experimental temperature. Now, during this uh, uh, adsorption process, so in this case, we look at the water adsorption of carbon, several phenomena can occur. First one, you have the monolay, we can, we can have monolay adsorption, multilay adsorption, condensation to pores, bulk adsorption, and hydration reaction. Here we look at the type four adsorption isotherms. Now, this is two cycles. What you see, the light green and red is the adsorption branch for this sample. So the adsorption branch is a characteristic by stepping up the relative pressure from zero to 90%. And as a result, the sample mass or amount absorbed is going up. The adsorption branch is, can be explained by this reducing the relative pressure from 90 to back to zero as a result, whereas the amount of sample, the amount of absorptive absorb is uh, decreasing. So this is typical adsorption desorption isotope and the gap between adsorption and desorption is called hysteresis. Now the adsorption uh, uh, desorption isotopes were actually classified into the, were grouped. And we look at the new classification on the right and the old classification here on the left. So we're gonna go briefly to the old, then you have the six type of adsorption isotopes. So we can have micropodos, which are typical type of one, Isotherms. So they are typical for, typical for micropores, solids having relative small external surfaces. And the limiting uptake is governed by the accessible micropore volume by, rather than by internal surface area. Then we have the non porous type 2 isotherms. So it is a reversible isotherm representing monolay multi absorption for non porous materials. Uh, type 3 is for big substrates with unlimited multilayer formation process. Type 4 and 5 is interesting for us. So this is typical for adsorption of mesoporous solids. Proceeds by multilayer adsorption followed by capillary condensation, resulting in type 4 or type 5 isotherms. Characteristic features of these type 4 and type 4 isotherms uh, uh, it's uh, are the hysteresis loops, which are associated with capillary condensation taking place in mesoporous and the limiting uptake of a range of high EOP naught. Okay, so now we've done this other theory for adsorption size. So now how can we obtain the physics option data that can be used actually to characterize the catalyst? So there are two major two main techniques to characterize the catalyst. One, uh, they collect the physical data. One is volumetric gas absorption apparatus, which is typically used for BET or porosity measurements. The second one is gravimetric with gas vapor absorption. I mean, the main difference between these two on, uh, in volumetric, we are looking at the, we measure the pressure changes. So once you do the gas of, uh, or absorptive of interest like nitrogen, you wait for pressure to equilibrate. And in the case of gravimetric, we actually continuously wait the sample during the during changes in concentration of gas or vapor zero sample. So I'm gonna mainly focus on the rest of the talk on uh, talking about the gravimetric vapor gas option analyzer, in this case DVS vacuum. So the DVS vacuum measures the uptakes and loss of vapor by material using balance at constant temperature and variable pressures up to 1,000 torr, allowing absorption behavior to accurately determine. Now, what you're looking at here, on the right-hand side, we have the picture, uh, picture of the DVS vacuum analyzer. On the left-hand side, is a scheme of the uh, DVS vacuum. So let's go briefly. So what do you have the DVS, one of the key benefits of these gravimetric vapor absorption or gas absorption stu uh, studies is that the, everything is under thermal dynamic equilibrium, which is achieved by the temperature enclosure or incubator operating in the range 20 to 70. So this is typical range we can generate full POP knowledge for organic solvents and water vapor, also in the set of the pumps. Now, when you look at the more in detail here, what we have here, the other striking difference is that this system does not require carrier gas poise operation. So we use the vacuum as driving force 
for the molecules to travel across the sample. So what it means, in this case, we will look at the water CO2, so we can connect water flour filled in, uh, we can connect flask filled in with water to MFC1, and uh, MFC2 is connected to gas. Now, the vapors are generated by liquid itself, by thermodynamic equilibrium. So in a typical experiment, we pull the headspace of the liquid over the sample, and we measure the amount of absorbed or dissolved, depending whether we're stepping up or stepping down the pressure. Now, under the dome here, we have ultra balance. And from the balance, we have suspended 200 down wires. On the left-hand side, we have the sample side. The right-hand side is the reference side. It's the symmetrical balance. And as you can see, there's also symmetrical flow coming over the sample. Now, around the sample side, we have high temperature preheater, which allows to heat up the samples up to 400 degrees and high vacuum. Uh, reference side is you just to count the balance. When we go over the masses over 150 milligrams, because the balance is capable of lifting up to one gram of sample masses. Now, the system measures the absolute pressure using two transducers. And our exit side, we have the butterfly wall. And uh, outside of the chamber, as you can see here, here you have the treble molecular pump and rotary pump here, and another pressure gauge. So, this is a typical system which is used to collect dynamic or static gravimetric vapor absorption measurements. So in a typical experiment, we load the sample and we measure and we flow the gases or vapors over the sample while we maintain the pressure constant using the butterfly valve, which continuously releasing closed loop uh, feedback from the baratons. And depending on the pressure, set pressure, it tries to maintain the set pressure by opening or closing of the valve, which actually regulates the amount of the sorbet molecule inside the chamber. Okay. Now, Look at the inside of the instrument, which is actually quite important. So now to load the sample, you just under these two clumps, this drops down, and you get access to the sample like in TGA. Now, so you have just this button, but what is important here, I want to show you. So this is the solvent reservoir, so this is the water, which is connected directly to the mass flow controller, and the second FC is connected to CO2. So this is very important that we're using the vacuum to take the hex plate, which is flow over the sample. So this is solely water vapor absorption. Now, this is set up, it's also important, which we're going to discuss later, where we're going to show the co-absorption data, then you have one MSC connected to water, one CO2, and we're going to mix these two streams, gas streams together in different flow ratio, and collect the isotherms. Look at the absorption, to look at the behavior of the catalyst during the CO2 hydration reactions. Now, so how this DVS works? So initially, as I said, you load the sample. Once you load the sample into the metal pan, we pull high vacuum, high temperature, we outgassing the material completely, we completely clean the surface of the sample and we empty the pores. And when we do that, what we observe, so here we have a solid red line, which represents the mass data. As a result, during this outgassing stage or drying stage, we observe the mass loss. Now, once the sample is cooled to absorption temperature, let's say we go from 400 to 25 degrees, we introduce the water vapor. So the water vapor pressure is shown by solid blue line. And the way we do it, so we go from 0%, let's say to 0.1%. As we do that, so downstream will be closed. We open the mass flow controller to fill up the chamber with this amount of the water vapor. And once we reach the set pressure, the both upstream and downstream are open. So we're gonna get continuously flow of water molecules over the sample while we come while we continuously record the changes in the mass. So as you can see, this is very important because in traditionally in volumetric system, this is done in the static method. When you just inject molecules, I wait for the equilibrium using the volume motion. As here is the flux of the molecule. As we do this, we continuously flow the molecules over the sample. What we observe, as we go from zero to let's say 0.1% scenario, we observe mass gain as a result of the sample taking up the water molecule or absorbing. And this mass gain is clearly visible here by the solid red line here. Now, as we step up the concentration of uh, molecules or absorptive molecules, the mass of the sample going up all the way up to 90%. Now, from this, so as we go up, so this is called adsorption. And when we step down the concentration or the pressure is called desorption. Now, from these mass equilibrium points at each relative pressure, we can construct the isotherms. What we can clearly see here, 
where the run in red is absorption, the right blue is resorption branch, and then you have the small hysteresis gap. Now, the equilibrium points at different pressure steps can be reached in time mode or mass equilibrium DMDT mode. So, most of the time, we can collect these data in uh, DMDT mode when we set certain equilibrium threshold value, and when this threshold value is met, software automatically goes to the next stage. The system allows you to collect very important in situ dry curves, or, uh, which can be obtained or outgassing curve. Uh, real time absorption, resorption kinetics, as shown before, absorption, resorption isotherm. So, for the kinetics data from mass equilibrium points and different point, uh, mass equilibrium at different relative pressure steps, we calculate the isotherms. We can also collect the absorption, desorption isobar. What it means we keep the temperature, we vary the temperature, but we keep the pressure constant. And for the isotherms, we can uh, collect the three different uh, temperatures, we can calculate heat of absorption and from the kinetic diffusion coefficients. Now, so that's this characterization. So let's first discuss the volumetric data. So here, look at the nitrogen absorption, desorption isotherms on the left-hand side of uh, pure silica aerogels and different loadings of nickel, nickel nanoparticles into silica uh, aerogels. So, so both uh, nickel nanomides isotherms show style four isotherms and hysteresis loop H1. So the isotherm, the type four isotherm indicates mesophore structure, and hysteresis loops indicates that catalyst has narrow range of uniform mesophores. And this is also in agreement with SEM uh, images which you showed earlier. So SEM images shows a very that more bulk materials go to actually mesophores uh, supports. In the table here, we look at the surface area of all these uh, catalysts, a poor volume, and uh, average uh, diameter. So now let's move to the uh, gases characterization using gravimetric vapor absorption technique. So here we're going to look first on the vapor absorption data. So on the top line mm -hmm. here shows the kinetics. So what we see here, solid red line is uh, changes in the mass, and solid blue line shows the changes in the relative pressure. So what we see here in the both, in all three cases, we step up the relative pressure from zero to 90% and back to zero. So we are the full absorption desorption cycles. Well, what we can see at the bottom line shows the respective uh, absorption desorption isotherms which we calculated from the kinetic data above. So all vapor absorption isotherms indicates how interaction between water vapor molecules and catalysts. So the adsorption process can be described by absorb water adsorption on surface functional groups, followed by the formation of cluster water molecules on existing water molecules, and pore filling around 50% uh, PVP naught. So when the pressure is high enough, and the post complete full field, a plateau is reached. We also observe formation of uh, hysteresis loops for all three samples because of capillary condensation and formation of irreversible hydrates. Now let's look at now the carbon dioxide studies at 25 degrees. Again, top row shows the kinetics for carbon dioxide adsorption up to one bar and the, the plot below shows the adsorption desorption isotherms. So what we can see here again the adsorption and desorption curves are almost identical. Uh, the process is reversible. So desorption curves are to the same point at the start of the analysis. There is no hysteresis loops observed, indicating no tensile strength applies to the pores. So they are, and what you can see, the pure silica gels shows the actually the highest adsorption capacity for carbon dioxide, followed by the nickel nanowires particles and then 700 pp nickel nanoparticles and uh, nickel nano nickel nanowires particle and nickel nanowires. Now we're going to move to the co-adsorption studies when we wanted to see actually the, uh, the behavior of the 
the performance of the catalyst in the presence of the water and CO2. So for this observation, what we can see that the, the absorption desorption behavior is very similar to the water absorption isotherms. So the all isotherms have open loopy hysteresis, as you can see for both silicon aerogels and silicon aerogels and nickel nanoparticles, the silicon aerogels and nickel nanowires. And all of the samples basically suggest that all samples are in the water. And one thing is nickel nanowires actually retain the water the strongest, as you can see from the hysteresis loops, because on the desorption bond, because on the desorption branch, the curve didn't return to the same point of the analysis. Nickel nanowires and inner nickel nanoparticles show the high absorption capacity compared to silica aerogel. We can also conclude that the catalyst activity is strongest for nickel nanoparticles, followed by nickel nanowires and silica aerogels. And this is determined by looking at the changes in slope of the isotherm. Isotherms. Now, so these are our results of the analysis. So let's move to the conclusions. So we can conclude that we successfully synthesized mesoporous silica gel, dough based nickel nanowires. The also the hydration tests or aqueous uh, characterization revealed that nickel nanowires, silica gels, catalyzes CO2 hydration uh, reaction, which was demonstrated stated uh, here, so with the highest loading of nickel wires for this strongest catalytic reaction. And DVS analysis, this will confirm that nickel nanowire show enhancing of the catalytic activity for carbon dioxide hydration reaction when compared to nickel nanoparticles, which is so demonstrated by this board here. Now, just again to acknowledge my colleagues at Central Measurement Systems, my collaborators at Newcastle University, and we also would like to EPSRC for the financial support and grant. Now, I would like to all, all thank you for all your attention. And the floor is open to any question you might have. Yes, we now invite the audience. Any questions they may have for the doctor um, in the panel to their right, please. If I could just get the ball rolling, uh, Vladimir, can I ask if there's any particular need or query that, um, that caused you to explore this topic in the first place? Oh, that is well, I think one of the main needs was to explore to actually improve the catalytic performance of the existing catalysts and also the ability to actually to use uh, employ the readily available silica aerogels for this kind of reaction. So we just want to use more uh, natural materials. Great, we have a question from Claudia Arnold. He asks, how large can the sample be? Can technical granules be tested as they are? Uh, in terms of the sample sizes, is actually if you look at the so here, so we typically use about 30 milligram of sample for this kind of the tests. Uh, we can use the pellets, as you can see here, we can load hold the pellets as you see here, or hold the beads. So there is no really limitation to the sample sizes. The sample size is mainly limited by the opening of the sample chamber. So if you don't work with the powder pellets, we can use also we can load a whole film or whole composite and hang it directly. So the main criteria is actually the size of the base of the sample. So typically 30 milligrams for measurements. Um, a question from oh excuse me. A question from Dr. Remy Gillette Nicolas. He, uh, he says, thank you for a nice presentation. And he asks, um, you showed a few open isotherms and I don't think it is related with a real hysteresis, uh, but rather an equilibrium effect. 
how do you make sure the data is properly uh, equilibrated? Oh, thank you very much for a very good question. I mean, the, I am, uh, we are under the equilibrium, since this is gravimetric vapor absorption collections. So we use, we can actually see the equilibrium, we can visualize the equilibrium points. And the equilibrium points was determined by set the threshold values for the measurements. So this threshold values is typically determined by the user or by the samples. And I agree, you in this case, we use equilibrium point that if the change in the mass is below 0 0.003% per minute for duration of the 10 minutes, the software automatically goes to the next stage. Okay. So this is the equilibrium criteria used for this experiment. Now, if this equilibrium criteria was not good enough, we can lower the equilibrium time by threshold, or we can increase the time for stability duration. So I agree that if you don't have the equilibrium, good equilibrium points, then you would get the larger hysteresis. But in this case, we also, because we also form the hydrates, as a result of the formation of the hydrates, you get a bit of the hysteresis. So one of the benefits of the gravimetric system is that you can visualize the kinetic, which shows the equilibrium points, and you can also see whether you are you in the equilibrium. And as we've shown previously in the kinetic data, most of the data were the equilibrium. But bear in mind, maybe because of the way the, it is plotted, it doesn't seem as an equilibrium. But in terms of the threshold, what we said, we met the threshold. If there is need to increase the threshold, that there's not a problem and uh, we can use even more rigid equilibrium criteria. Thank you. Uh, another question here from Claudia Arnold. She asks, during co-adsorption, can you distinguish between the uh, adsorbents? Adsorbates. Mm -hmm. In dynamic mode, it's very difficult to distinguish between uh, amount of absorbed water and CO2. And the reason is because we measure total uptake by sample. Okay? And the total uptake contains contribution from both carbon dioxide and water. In order to distinguish amount of amount absorbed from CO2 and water, we need another measuring device which can tell us how much of each is absorbed. Now, there is the other way to look at it. There was no purpose of this because you wanted to do it in the flow system. The other way to look at the co-absorption is that you can do it in the static mode that you actually preload, you equilibrate the sample with a certain concentration of the water vapor, then you bring uh, CO2 on top of it if you have the right type of the materials. In this way, we can, this, we can determine the amount of CO2 absorbed at a constant loading of the water vapor. I agree there is a few assumptions to be made, but this is the most straightforward and easiest way to see the performance of the materials when we perform the co-absorption uh, measurement. Because one thing I recently did the data, actually not necessary when you preload the sample, let's say with 1% RH, and then you bring, you bring the CO2 on top of it up to one bar, it does not necessarily mean that your mass is gonna go up when you bring the T, when you increase the pressure. What I observed actually the mass was going down. So if you had the chemical option, some reaction takes place, you can actually determine from the static measurements whether you actually have the physics option, chemical option processes, or whether we're actually absorbing the CO2 or not. So if you are really interested in determining the amount of each absorbs, you have to go to use either static method, or the other option is to use for dynamic method is to employ the ideal absorption theory simulations where we're going to use pure absorption isotherm of water and CO2 and, uh, and then the composites and then the mixtures. You, and these isotherms are then used to feed the data in order to predict the amount of each absorbed. And then the mixture of water CO2, experimental data then compared with the simulated data. That's the only way to do it. The, uh, another option we're looking at now at the moment is that we could actually use FTRI or other techniques to actually do it simultaneously in order to determine the water and CO2, the amount of water and CO2 at the same time. A question here from uh, Vissam Fortas. Uh, they ask, to what degree can carbon dioxide increase the temperature? Uh, 
I'm not sure I understand the questions. I mean, uh, I mean we can perhaps, perhaps, we, perhaps we give uh, Miss Sam the opportunity to unmute the, uh, his mic and ask uh, and pose a question himself. <laughs> he may be able to pose it better than, than me. Uh, Miss Sam, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask the question directly to, uh, to Dr. Vladimir, please do so. Well, so the question is typed as, um, to what degree can carbon dioxide increase the temperature? I'm not entirely sure I understand the question. So in our system, we can work gas absorption isotherms only up to one bar in the temperature range to 20 to 400 degrees. Okay. Uh, we have a, another question from Dr. Remy. He asks, um, can you use aggressive gases in the instrument, such as hydrogen sulfide, and how many vapor sources can we use simultaneously? So, first answer to the first question: Yes, we can use the hydrogen sulfide and let's say uh, SO two as well or ammonia. So we can use most of the aggressive gases in the system. As you saw, so we have the two mass flow controllers, so you can use the two vapors at the same time. So you can have the water. And xylenes or water or uh, benzene or any vapors or you can have two gases now you can also do three components that you could have basically co2 or h2s mixed with nitrogen and on the other uh, msc you can have the solvents of your choice so at the moment you are limited two or three composition maximums to measure the uh, vapors option or gas absorption isotherms Great, thank you. Uh, and Vissam has resubmitted his question now. He's, uh, he's reposed that as, to what degree can the carbon dioxide increase the temperature of the samples? Oh, so it's really, we haven't observed any increase of the sample temperature in this experiment, but when you, the, the, in the past, we, I saw in some of the experiments, the sam, sample could be increased, sample temperature, especially when you work with the water, could be increased by two or three degrees. In the case of uh, carbon dioxide, we haven't seen any temperature changes during the measurements. Okay, great. Uh, I think that is all the questions we have for today. But if anyone does have any further questions for Dr. Martis, please do feel free to send them through to marketing at surfacemeasurementsystems.com. Uh, oh, oh, Remy's had one final question. Uh, do you have time for this, Vladimir? We'll get this in? Yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Um, he says, um, he knows, he says, I, SMS has a history of allowing IR probes to be coupled with DVS instruments. Is this a potential option for the DVS vacuum? Not at the moment. I mean, if you want to measure just the temperature, of the sample in situ, that's possible to couple. But if you wanted to measure infrared, yeah, no, at the moment we cannot use the, we can only measure the uh, temperature using the infrared, but we cannot measure actually infrared data in DVS. It's not the option at the moment. Also, no, you won't be able to use the preheater if you're going to go for IR. So this uh, will actually limit your operating temperature down to 50 degrees only. Right. And a final question from Vissa. He's asked, um, is DVS analysis more important or valuable than DSC analysis? Oh, um, I think this is a very good question. And the answer is both analysis are very important, but the DVS analysis is driven by the applications and, and use of the material. So if you work in a field, which requires to understand the absorption behavior of the material, or you try to use the material in distillation columns, or you try to determine the, or you're designing new chemical plants and you want to know how much it is released, I would agree a DVS analysis will be more important. So it's, as I said, this all depends on the application of what you're trying to understand. And DVS is usually one of the 
main application or characterization tools when you want to understand the behavior of the material in realistic conditions because we never would so yeah I, I think the answer is basically it all depends on the application and what you're trying to do so yeah if it's really related to desorption science yes i would say the dvs is more important than the sc and also if the water plays an important role in your application and it's got a huge it can have huge effect on uh, performance of the material or performance of the system yes dvs will be more important for than uh, the sc great uh I think we'll close things off there. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Martis. Do you have uh, anything final to add for our audience? I just would like to thank you for our participants. And if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. So I'm happy to answer all your remaining questions. Thank you. And I'm sure all our audience will join me in thanking you once again, Vladimir, for taking the time to give this presentation today. Uh, we once again invite everyone to submit any, any further queries or questions uh, they have about this topic or our instruments to marketing at surfacemeasurementsystems.com. Uh, we have a few upcoming uh, webinar sessions which uh, we think you might be interested in. We are taking part in the Bion Innovative Cluster Innovation Coffee Series. That we will have a session covering um, characterization of synthetic and bio-based composites on the 11th of November. And from our new North American office, Dr. Daniel J. Burnett will be giving a follow-up uh, webinar to his poster session at the AAPS FarmSci event. So uh, please go to our website, www.surfacemeasurementsystems.com to find out more about those up that upcoming educational content. And we hope to see you all there. Thank you all again very much for joining us today and I wish you an enjoyable rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.